Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Anderson. We are so excited. We have Woodridge native and Illinois author Kathleen Rooney with her new novel is called Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. You'll absolutely love this character. It's a gotta read. Welcome back to Anderson. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Well, I think we were just talking before we started about you. You were a bookseller here yes. at our Naperville store and also at the Downers Grove store. Yeah, I was back when I was an undergraduate and yeah. an aspiring writer. So it's cool to be here as, you know, a published author. Yeah, and it's great to have you here. We like, like wow, one of our graduates yeah, is yeah, so now a, coming. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. this isn't your first novel or your first publication no. by any means, but but tell tell me as as a former bookseller, and yes. I know you were in, when you're undergraduate you were working here and in the Downers Grove store. What perspective has that added to your career as an author moving on, you know, in in your education and also yeah. now in your poetry and and novel writing and nonfiction writing? Yeah, I yeah. think one of the things that has stayed with me all these years is just um, the power and enthusiasm of booksellers and I remember you know the excitement of watching other booksellers hand sell right. things and just fall in love with the title and decide that this is the one that they're just gonna really get behind and put in people's hands um, and then learning how to do that myself through following people's examples and that sort of imitation um, and feeling that same enthusiasm and I think um, both you know my husband who's an author and I um, really have come to see how that kind of like word of mouth and that kind right. of grassroots sure. passion right. is just there's no substitute for yeah, it. There is it, and you know as we always say that no no good writer is is not a voracious reader. Yes, I mean, they, they definitely go have to go. Yeah, hand in hand. yeah, and I so in addition to Andersons, I also worked. Um, I should just give a shout out to um, when I was in graduate school in Boston, the uh, Museum of Fine Arts. Oh sure, there they have a fantastic bookstore. Yeah, they do. They um, do. Super super well curated. Sean Halpert you know, is one of the people who's responsible for that. And so, you know, that kind of continued my education and just always being aware of how much was out there, not just my own little niche of what I wanted to be writing, but right, just the big right. world. So I think those those two things, the hand sell and then just the vastness are yeah. really and important. And just being surrounded by books is yeah. something you have to, by osmosis, you're going to absorb, totally. right? Totally, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. it feels so good to be here in between yeah. the books. This is great. <laughs> Stay here forever. Well, I'm going to tell you, when my Macmillan rep mm -hmm. sold me Lillian Boxes, because I buy the Macmillan books awesome. for the stores, I had to read it right away, and I did. And she brought an arc with her. I want to tell you, I love this book. Thank you so I hate much. To, I hate it to have it end because I just want to. She's the kind of woman, especially even at 85 years old, you just wanted to hang out with yes, her. Yes, you know? yeah. So I just wanted to tell you what, what a wonderful read it was. Thank you. And I loved her character. But I think what I, I think everyone would love to hear the story yeah. behind Lillian Boxwick you know, takes a walk, and the woman that was sort of the, the inspiration. Yes. So tell us about the seeds when they started to germinate for this incredible novel. Yeah, so um, the real life inspiration for Lillian Boxfish is a woman named Margaret Fishback, um, and she was called to my attention by my very, very good high school friend, Angela Osser, who was working um, in 2006 as an archivist. And so she was doing her library sciences degree in Chapel Hill, she had this um, internship at Duke University, which happens to have one of the biggest um, centers for sales, advertising, and marketing. Yeah. There's a huge archive, um, which I didn't know. Um, and so she was the receiving archivist for Fishback's papers. So that means she got to be the first person outside of this woman's family to start figuring out what to do with the materials. Wow. So long story short, she started doing this work, and she noticed that this woman was um, kind of a proto-feminist, really big career person, highest paid female advertising copywriter in the 30s and very proud of it. Also a light verse poet, famously kind of like Dorothy Parker, you know, like sneering at love and things yeah, like that. Right. Um, and just really funny. And so she called me up and said, you've got to know about Margaret Fishback. Um, so I went to work in the archives and totally fell in love too. But this was back in 2007. Um, and so I knew this was remarkable material, but I didn't know what to do with it. Right. Because I'm not a biographer, 
I'm a creative writer. So I was like, what am I going to do with this, this great stuff? So I sat on it, worked on other projects. Flash forward to 2013 when we had that huge blizzard. I don't know if you remember, everything oh, shut yeah. down. I oh, teach yeah. at DePaul, they canceled class. So I've been sitting on this idea for a while um, and had finally started to think, what if I paired Margaret Fishback with my own love of walking? Yeah. And so being cooped up on a day when I would have rather been walking, I was like, that's what I'll do. I'll take this real life yeah. figure, use my own love of flannery or driftless walking through a city and kind of like weave the two strands. Because um, I needed that thing to set me free from the facts because yeah, I didn't want to sure. just yeah. recycle her story. Right. So that was the thing that let me get really creative and just start making stuff up about her. Yeah. So so did Margaret, do, was she a walker? Do you know she, she no, was? No, she was not. She wasn't? No. Nope. So that, that's, what, that's one of the best things I loved about this yeah. novel was the way she walked. And especially yeah. this walk that she takes on New Year's Eve yeah. in 1984. Four. Mm -hmm. And she's 85 years old. Yes. But I, I just love that, and the way she's Thank reflecting you. back on her life yeah. as she's walking. But tell, but tell us a little bit about, I know you're a walker. Yes, huge And walker. tell us a little bit about all of the walking, and what, what, it, what does it do for an author to walk and, you know, to observe, to yeah. talk, to interface with people and surroundings and buildings yeah. in, in any particular city? Yeah, so... Um, I, you know, even since I was a little kid, I've always, like, anytime I arrive at a place, want to map it with my feet. And I think that's kind of the best thing that you can get as a writer because a good walk, um, and I happen to like city walks, but mm -hmm. if you walk in the country, if you walk wherever, that's totally acceptable. Everybody do you. Um, <laughs> but I love cities because to me, that's where it's the most vivid form of time travel because I think walking is time travel in the sense that you're moving through space, but you're also moving through time. You take a three mile walk. It's probably going to take you an hour, right? So you've done space, you've done time. But the thing that I think more speaks to your question is when you're walking in a city, especially where there's so many layers of stuff that's been torn down, rebuilt, repurposed, mm -hmm. all that stuff, you're also doing that kind of time travel where you see something and you wonder, was that always there? What did it used to be? Right. What yeah. used to be there? Sure. And you talk to people and sometimes you meet old people who are like, oh, I remember when that was the Woolworths lunch counter. Or, oh, I remember when that was the right. community bank and now it's you know, something else. So right. I think, um, and then also just the encounters with people. I, I think a lot of times people are sometimes fearful of cities, especially Chicago where I like to walk, but I have so many good encounters. I don't want to sugarcoat it, but I really do think if you just kind of like Lillian, right. meet people with true curiosity and respect, most people are excited to talk to other people if you yeah. give them a chance. So That's I right. found that to be true and I love that. Well, and, and, and her character, you know, in, in so many ways she's very brave. Yes. And, you know, and she's, but to walk and, and the, the people she's encountered, you know, like a family who wants to invite her in for dinner yeah. or it's some muggers, yeah. you know, or it's a Vietnam vet. Yeah. And she's encountering this, but along the way she's noticing the differences of this 10 miles, it's like 10 miles. Yeah, 10.4 miles. Yeah. 10.4 miles. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mapped it out on a Google map. <laughs> but I just, I just thought the whole, all these confluence of all these different things in the story just made it so unique. Thank you. And yeah, I really liked that, you know, that, that, that journey of yeah. her walk, but also the journey back in time yes. for her. I'm so glad And you not just in it. her life, but also in her surroundings. Yes. Yeah. 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 That was yeah. one of the most fun things to do. Yeah. Research. So tell us, tell us a little bit about the, you know, the, the research that you did, because I know you had to do, and I love the map inside. Yeah. The book, yeah, and I love you. the fact that you put in real places, yeah, and real places that existed in the 30s or maybe were still existing in the 1980s, yeah. But what about the research of the 30s and what it was like for women, yeah, to be in a position like she was? Yeah, so I think you know, a lot of the research, you know, a good piece of research advice that um, I read in this book by Janet Burroway, who teaches at Northwestern, um, that she shares is don't just read about the time period, but read in the time period, because right. then you're not just getting the facts of what it would have been like, but you're hearing from the voices themselves. So I did a lot of research on um, ad women, like doing just books that were published, like even like handbooks and manuals that were published by like women who were in the industry being kind of like, so you want to be an advertising woman. So stuff like that. Right. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I loved about learning myself when I first encountered Fishback was I think everybody thinks of Mad Men, right? Because it's a great show, and that was a real era, um, and the outfits are great, and all. You know, of course, it's like popular for a reason, and that's legitimate history. But I think what I didn't know, and what a lot of people don't know, is how prior to that very like masculine, aggressive, boozy '60s right. thing, yeah. there was this '20s and '30s thing where advertising was one of the few professions where women could right. go and excel, and it was white collar, 
they could make a lot of money, they were using their brains. Um, and I personally didn't know that till I started researching that and I got very excited about just seeing all their accounts and how successful right. they were. And, and, and knowing about her, about Margaret, yeah. and knowing that she became one of the, high, the highest paid women yeah. in her business, that must have been really fascinating to look at some of the things that she had actually done. Yeah. And what was so cool about the book is that you put in her some of her poetry. Yeah. I mean, the actual poems in the book are her. They're by her, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that was yeah. fun too. And, and you know that was one of the things. I'm a poet as well. Yeah. And so I just thought that was very cool that she was someone who was so you know, professional on top of her field mm -hmm. as an ad woman, but um, was also like, back then there was this huge lucrative market for light verse, and so she was just producing this stuff too and publishing it, and it's delightful, and I've worked with the Poetry Foundation. Um, if people read this and are curious, I would direct them to the Poetry Foundation website, because her family gave us permission to put, um, oh, I think there's like a dozen okay. of her poems oh, up I'll there now. That out. Yeah, because yeah. I really, that's one of the things, I put them in the book, because they were perfect and I didn't yeah. think I could improve on them. <laughs> also, because yeah. part of my aim is to get people to know a little bit more about the real woman and all right. that she accomplished. So talking about cities, and you said you like to walk cities. Yes. Differences between Chicago and say New York or DC or yeah. you know those, those different cities where, yeah. you, where you've walked. Yeah. So um, I, you know, the places, the cities that I've lived in that I've especially loved walking are Chicago, of course, and then also um, I lived in Boston for grad school, D.C. for undergrad. Um, I never lived in New York, but I've been there a lot and I love walking. Um, so I think the biggest difference is sort of like a density and a size. Mm. Like D.C. and Boston are so tiny. Um, Boston, you could walk across the whole city. I mean, the urban area is vast, but the city proper, yeah. you could cross it. And I'm going to say less than an hour, which is nuts. Yeah. Um, right. Whereas Chicago, especially north to south, Oh. So big. Yeah, right. um, and so I, one of my favorite things about Chicago is you can have that density. Like if you're in the loop, it's comparable to like Manhattan maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's never as crowded, but you know, you get the idea. Whereas there's like my favorite place to walk lately has been way down on the south side, right on the lake, the old U.S. Steelworks that's oh, now defunct. Yes. Yeah. Um, and they've taken down most of the metal, but there's these like huge berms where the structure used to be. And it's just this contemporary ruin and then there's like a channel where fishermen are but there's almost no walkers so when I go down there oh, wow. I you know with, I walk with my friend Eric who's a fellow DePaul professor in Flenor okay. um, and also I will say one of the things I admire about Lillian is she just walks by herself and I think that's possible as a woman but I personally prefer to walk not well, always yeah. alone just yeah. for sure. reasons sure. that yeah. I'm sure everyone yeah. understands um, and so but it'll just be me and him and we'll have like no other people so to be in a city and have that almost zombie experience of being the only people in this vast landscape is something I've only personally experienced in Chicago. Oh, I'm sure yeah. you could find it in other cities. Right. I haven't. Um, I think some people might find that depressing, but I find it really no, beautiful. That, yeah. No, <laughs> so, no, it's just totally stunning. Yeah, right. I love Lillian, just her character, and because she's smart, she's witty, yeah. she's snarky, she's mm -hmm. sarcastic, and she's funny. But the humor you put in her character and in the book, her humor hits the mark in more deeper ways, which I thought was really cool. And I was wondering, Thanks. was Margaret Fishback, was she like Lillian in that way, in her character? Because she had to be strong in what, because we don't yeah. want to get too many spoils or what no. well, happens in her life. Yeah. And, but I just thought her character was just fabulous. Yeah, and so a lot of it is based on Fishback, but a lot of it is departure, but I think the wit and then I think the thing that they do share, without giving too much of the plot away, is this um, sort of determination and perseverance. So there's this, uh, I think Fishback is an immensely talented figure, for real, and that struck me. But what else struck me is just working in her archive, there were so many feet, they call it feet, you know, because like your archive is however many feet of papers long. Right, and right. as I just was plowing through these feet, um, from sort of the 20s all the way up, to like the late 60s is when her archive, you know, she became less active. So that yeah, is one yeah. unfortunate thing is that the real Margaret Fishback was not a walker because she went into a, a more physical and mental decline sooner than I was able to make my character. Right. But yeah. for the time she was active, I was struck by, I mean, there's so many talented people in the world, but I think what made Fishback so successful is just her grit and how she stuck with it. And there were so many rejection letters and so many corrections, you know, for her poetry or for her ads. So it wasn't like she was just perfect out of the gate. Right. She was often very good, but she like just dealt with constructive criticism or rejection and just kept getting back up yeah, and going. Right, and so I think right. 
I found that very inspiring and definitely tried to put it in yeah. the book. So, so what is one of your favorite Margaret Fishback poems? Do you yeah, know? well, so it's and, the well. There's one of them that I that, that I absolutely Blackout love. Blackout is my favorite. Well, the one the one she talks about here, and I'll just read it. Yeah, this is. Um, in the book, oh, I don't want to give too much away. Oh, that's okay. But she's talking, you know, this is, please God, arrange to let yeah. me be a ghost, if you will be so kind, just long enough to ease my mind. A horror little ghost, and there I'll sit upon his bed and stare until his tortured eyelids prickle. Yes. I love that one. Yeah. yeah. She's, and I think, I mean, that one, of course, is so light and breezy, but it's about this much heavier, right. yeah. sad. Yeah topic, this right. longing for this lost love and this wish for sort of sweet revenge, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, right. And my favorite poem, yeah. and I also put it similar in that section, okay. yes. um, is Blackout, and it's very short. Right. And she says, when life seems gray and short of fizz, it seems that way because it is. Right. And I just like that. It's a funny poem, but she's, you know, just fully admitting sometimes yeah. things yeah. are tough. And sometimes you can change your attitude, but sometimes things are just bad and you have to Right, Move right. On. but there there was just so much wit in yeah. in this and her character that it was it was such a joy to read. And I love the fact that you put not only the poems but there's a letter. Yeah, that she wrote to her husband. Yeah, and it was so interesting you put that in there and fit it into when he's off. Uh, yeah, World War Two. War Two. Yeah. yeah, and I think and I I would be remiss if I didn't in this you know context give a shout out to um, the family of uh, Margaret Fishback mm -hmm. and her son um, Anthony Antolini who goes by Tony um, as a nickname. Um, Tony is the one who decided in 2006 after his mom, because his mom died in 1984, so again, she wouldn't have been able to take this walk because she wouldn't have been around on New Year's Eve 1984, right. but um, he was the one who was smart enough and astute enough to be like, mom's material should be preserved, so right. I am so grateful to him for doing that, yeah. um, but then also for being such a generous and courteous person, because I contacted him in 2007 when I was in the archive and was like, hey... I'm the first person in here, and he was like, great, that's awesome, that's why I donated it. And then suddenly, t almost 10 years later, I'm like, hey, I wrote a novel sort of about your mother. And not yeah. everyone's going to love that, you know what I mean? D d have you heard from him? Um, I haven't, he loved it. He's been so supportive, oh, and so that's, that's why I want to say, oh, I don't know if this will make him, but I want to say thank you. Because he, so you're probably worried about that. Well, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, right? it's not yeah. that he would have been able to you know, stop me, but I don't want to do anything where anything wants me to stop. You know, yeah, yeah <laughs> well, sure, I'm yeah, really right. happy with it, and he was so yeah. much gratitude to to yeah. Tony Antolini for his yeah. support and for letting me put the letter in and yeah. use the poems and all that. Yeah, it just it they, they blend it so well. Thank so you, you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so R. H. Macy's. When you think of Macy's in the '30s, yeah. and compared to what's happening to Macy's today, yeah. you know, which is so sad. I mean, you're it thinking is. about them closing so many of their their brick and mortar yeah. stores. So. Um, what was it like in the 30s, you know, and, and what was it like to be an ad woman, to, to be yeah. writing advertising? Yeah, I mean, I think what I, yeah. what I was struck in my research is um, almost like Macy's as being this little city within the city, um, yeah. because it truly yeah. was the department store. And so Margaret, you know, just so people can understand, because um, she was an in-house institutional copywriter, so she was like the voice of Macy's. Yeah. Um, and it was really quite a voice to be then. Um, they, she was up on the 13th floor in these beautiful offices, um, and there were just, you know, level, levels and levels of the whole store beneath her. So one of the things that I was struck by and I tried to put in the book is that she would walk through the store all the time to just, you know, look at all the things that she was supposed to be writing right. about and selling people, you know, everything from like tiny little kitchenware to like women's dresses to right. like sofas to the liquor department. So they had all this stuff that I think it's hard for us in 2017 to imagine what a true emporium and kind of wonderland yeah. in the 30s, especially during the Depression, oh, for sure. to walk into a place like that would have been. Yeah. And there was there was one section, that, and the way her talent for doing that, and this is, I think she was talking to her mother, she said something about, she, I think she's, she's thinking back on her mom and what her yeah. mom thought about her, and she said, um, she goes, I couldn't argue for years that was how I did my work at R.H. Macy's. If I understood better than you did yourself while you thought or did or wanted something, then I could control you. Yeah. Not in any kind of dramatic way, like something out of the Manchurian Candidate. I love that part. But, you know, really, that's the way. She had that confidence yeah. to know that she could write something to convince somebody. Right. And I think, and, I mean, yeah, that's, that's right. one of the differences, yeah. too. And, and uh, why I was struck by her, and this gets in the novel, and apologies if I'm stealing your question, but, like, <laughs> she thinks a lot about how not just Macy's has changed, but how advertising has changed. Because I think she fancies herself, and because in my research I, I noticed this, that it was persuasion and it was convincing mm -hmm. and it was narrative. I would tell you a story about your life and what you desired and like persuade you almost like seductively right, to, right. to make a purchase. Whereas then later she kind of makes these points about, you know, kind of like the where's the beef jingle. And, you know, she and by 1984, she sees that her more elegant time has passed and it's just 
people yeah. aren't doing it that way anymore. Right. She kind of has to think about that. Right. You know, thinking about the, the, the real places that, that you put into the book, yeah. did you have to go back and make sure that certain places were at certain times were there yes. as she's taking her walk and she's reflecting back? Or what, even, you, know, you mentioned even the Twin Towers, yeah. where she's walking on New Year's Eve. Right. And it's so interesting, but, um, and of course those were built at that time, right. but thinking about places, she's thinking of her past that yeah. are no longer there. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the trickiest things, and like the map that's in the inside cover of the book is the Google map I was working on, but what I kept wishing for and was able to cobble together on my own was like a Google map that wasn't just contemporary, but that you could type in an intersection and a year, <laughs> and oh. it would show you. It doesn't exist, but programmers. I know, no kidding. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> I don't think we should that'd be, be able wonderful. to do that. Yeah, um, yeah. But I had to just track that down and make sure yeah. like, okay, you know, Delmonico's has been in New York since 1827, but then like... It had several locations, all mm -hmm. in like very, very lower Manhattan, but like where yeah. would it have been in the 40s when she goes and where would it have been in, you know, 1984 and stuff like that. So right. most of the stuff in there is real. Some of it I just made up knowing that there was like a bar there, sure. so I yeah. just make things right. up. But yeah. when they go to 21, the speakeasy um, in the 20s, that really was there. So it was, it was super fun to try yeah, and make I bet. sure I, bet. I didn't screw things up. Yeah. <laughs> So Kathleen, this, this is not your first novel, and your no. first novel is called Oh Democracy. And yes. it was it's based on a, an experience that you had yourself yes. and being an aide in Senator Dick Durbin's office. Yeah. So, you know, the book is is it's happening now. <laughs> so I want to know yeah. what you think about this. And yeah. tell us a little bit about that book and your experiences of working with Senator Durbin. Yeah, so um, the book is set during the 2008 election when, you know, of course, Barack Obama uh, was on target to become our first black president and also set in the shadow of, um, I never say Durbin in the book, but it's clear that's who I'm talking about, you know, Illinois' senior senator. Um, and it's based on the time that I worked as a Senate aide, I um, was on like the press team and I was only ever in the Chicago office, not the DC office. So I kind of wanted to give what mm -hmm. I was thinking of as this worm's eye view, right. not a bird's eye view, not top down, but from, you know, the perspective of the grunts who are the ones who are sure. like, super behind the scenes and don't have a lot of power, but are very true believer, mm -hmm. um, which is certainly how I saw myself when I was a Senate aide. Um, and it's a comedy. And what's funny is when I published it, <laughs> things seemed so, this is 2014 and things yeah. seemed so, progressed and I was worried foolish me that the stuff I was writing about would seem quaint or not relevant like all this yeah. scandal oh, and all this yeah. rudeness and ridiculousness yeah. um, and so it's, I was wrong yeah, you, and yep. it's still relevant yeah, it's so relevant <laughs> and it's funny that now that this book has been coming yeah. out more people have been getting in touch about oh democracy to be like hey we're yeah. interested again and I'm like good I guess yeah, <laughs> silver <no>. lining <laughs> yeah please bring it yeah. paperback please yeah no, I hope so yeah. working on it my agent has it <laughs> okay good 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 so tell her she needs to do that okay well and the title's perfect thank you yes a democracy yes. exclamation point yeah <laughs> right. so you've written in so many genres you know whether it's nonfiction, fiction poetry what do you enjoy the most or is it just depend on yeah that's yeah, a, yeah. a very good question yeah. um I don't want to sound like <laughs> non-answer, but I love them all, but for different reasons yeah. and for different things. Um, poetry was my first love. I just, as a kid, like even, you know, as a tiny, tiny kid, I was like dictating poems to my mom, yeah. who was very lovely and would write them down. Um, and I do this thing now, typewriter poetry poems while you wait, where a bunch of my friends and I show up with typewriters and write poems on demand. So I love poetry for its shortness and its immediacy and right. that quickness of connection. Um, but I also love nonfiction because it's fun to think about stuff and yeah. take people on that journey. And finally, I, I, lately I've been doing fiction. I'm working on, I have a couple more novels, like one that's almost done and one that I'm just starting. Um, and lately I've been very much enjoying that architectural quality of fiction and the ability, I think, that you have to have, or at least I have to have, to just disappear into it. Yeah. Um, and just get really absorbed and world build and just spend a lot of time with these people mm -hmm. like Lillian Boxfish. Yeah. And yeah. It sounds weird, but I think most novelists feel like friends they, I mean they start if you're doing it right they start to feel super real to you oh and for that's sure a cool feeling so well and, and talking about that was it hard to leave her it was it was yeah. it was hard to, I mean I'm not gonna spoil things but she goes through some tough times <laughs> yeah she does and yeah. writing her tough times was really hard and then when I got to the end I was so happy with where I left her but yeah. I was very sad yeah. to see her sure. go yeah <laughs> right for sure so tell us you have your husband is a writer yes also. So, so what's it like having two writers at home I think um, I think it's great. I mean, knock on wood, we're really yeah. lucky that we're yeah. not um, competitive, you know, in general or with each other. Yeah. And I think we're very supportive. And I, you know, Martin is a perfectionist and likes to not show his work to anyone until he's really happy with it. I mean, he thinks he 
he is not above being edited, but he likes to get it really, really polished okay. and then get feedback. Um, I like to show things a little more in progress. Right. Yeah. Um, and I have a bunch of friends from grad school who I show stuff to, but he is always my best, most astute, most thorough reader. And yeah. I am ah. so grateful every day that I have yeah. that like right in my house. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that's pretty cool yeah, to have that right is. at home. And his, yeah, and his so, book is great too. Yeah. So. so when you think about, you know, You've been an editor, yes. right? You've been an editor. So you've been on a lot of sides of yes. this. Bookseller, editor, yeah. you know, author, you've sort of... So in your, your teaching at yes. DePaul, mm -hmm. so what, what do you tell your students? I mean, because as an editor, you have that perspective and yeah. an author. And then also for the person who's going to put that end product into a reader's hands. Yeah. So, so how does that, how do, what do you tell your students yeah, that, I mean, from I that think, perspective? I tell them so many things, but I think the thing that I tell them is, um, kind of like what I was just saying about being struck by Margaret Fishback, is that a lot of people have talent, and that's great, and I hope they all have talent, and I do believe mm -hmm. things can be cultivated and you can become better, but the number one thing, honestly, that sets you apart, and this might sound cheesy, is just like working hard and persisting and not showing up, because it's a tough business, right. and you're going to get rejected a lot, and you need to learn, and that's not because people are mean, and it's not always even because your thing's not good, it's just not a fit. There's lots of moving parts, you know, from all right. sides, an editor looking for a particular thing at a particular time, or a book being almost good, but not quite good enough, or being on topic, but slightly, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I try to tell them that they just have to not give up, but also be very self-directed. And I find it, this is a little rambly, but I'm coming to a point. Um, I find it hard to grade stories. So I don't believe in saying like, oh, your story is an A, your story is a C. I grade more on like, did you do it? Did you try? Did you mm -hmm. challenge yourself? Did you do it on time? I don't take late work. You have to come to class, which sounds so basic. But I think as a writer, those are the things that sustain you in right. the times when things aren't going well, right? You, you don't have an agent. Your book's getting rejected. No magazines are saying yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to keep finding it within yourself to do it, because yeah. otherwise, oh, well, you have to do the to work, quit. right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's totally. like any other job. Yeah, right? so it doesn't matter how talented yeah, you are if you don't try, right. it's right. not going to go anywhere. Yeah. So. And I wanted to ask you about what it was like working with St. Martin's, and compared yeah. to, I mean, a, a much bigger publisher, right? Than than your previous novel. So, yeah. so what was that experience like? And I wanted to tell you, I love the cover. Yeah, thank you. They they did a great job. Yeah. Um, yeah. I so I published with you know. Counterpoint, which is a trade press but a smaller press. I publish right. with university presses, independent, you know, small presses. Um, and I love them all. Um, but St. Martin's has really struck me with how kind they are and how mm -hmm. attentive, for, even for a huge place, just yeah. how they manage to have this almost like boutique -y, tiny feel, at least from my experience of working with them. Um, and so just like how smart and how dedicated the individuals are. Um, even with the cover, it's funny you say that because the first cover they gave me, I didn't love. And I didn't necessarily want to say anything, but my agent was kind of like, you should say it. If you're not happy with it, you right. should say it now. Um, but I didn't want to be difficult or anything like that. But I did, yeah. and I'm glad I did, because they were so nice about it. Yeah. Um, you could tell they weren't expecting me not to like it, but they were like, okay. So they went back, and this is how we ended up. This was only the second try, but that's how we ended up with this cover. I mean, and yeah. I find this cover so iconic. And I'm not patting myself on the back, because I had nothing to do no, with it. No, <laughs> I love it. I love it, because it's all on a white background. Yeah, but it and really, her, yeah. You know, it's her. Her coat and her hat. Yeah, it's her. Yeah. They, they really made the character. So just stuff like that, how they were just so, even for a huge place that could very easily mm -hmm. have decided they weren't going to do that kind of give and take or that kind of detail work. They were so detail-oriented and so gracious. Yeah. And so thumbs up. And she even has a lipstick on. Yes, because exactly. I, I mean, because she was, she was very into her fashion yes. and her shade of lipstick yeah. and all that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I thought it was perfect. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. They'll be yeah. happy to hear that. Yeah. So what, tell us what you're working on now. I know you had mentioned something. A little yeah. Quick. So I have um, two, two novel projects. One that's almost done that Martin, my husband, is you know in the process of giving me feedback on. Okay. Um, and it's called currently An Instinct. And it's a World War I novel um, told partly from the perspective of a heroic soldier, and partly, this might sound nuts, but from the perspective of a messenger pigeon. So it's oh, an animal narrator, but yeah. um, she just speaks first person. So I'm interested in this idea of animal heroism and female war heroism and how this seems to come together in this one story. So, wow. Um, well, and then I have a brand new great. thing that's set in the Quad Cities, and it's about these tweens, um, these like 13-year-old girls, one of whom believes herself to be contacted by an alien from outer space, and the other of whom has to decide how she feels about this happening to her friend. Okay. So, oh. so very different, <laughs> but yeah, yeah hopefully that's it's great. great. So well, stay, okay. stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> okay. Kind of goes along with what you've done, but yes. something very different, which yes. is so great. Yeah, you keep us on you. our toes. That's great. Kathleen, thank, thank you so much for talking with me, and congratulations on you. Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. Thank you. Loved it. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Great conversation with author 
Kathleen Rooney about her new novel, Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. You're going to love this novel. It's a great character about an 85 year old woman taking a walk across Manhattan and reflecting on her life. Thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed.